Now, I know that I am speaking to the choir here because basically, if you come to a conference that's entitled Making Sense of Kids, uh, you're already believing that that is what is necessary and want to be part of that. Uh, so thank you uh, for coming. And, uh, and uh, it, I, it was a daunting task for me. Uh, how do I... I, I, I've been trying to do this, make sense of kids. I have now 24 courses, and then how do I take 24 courses, distill it to the essence, for about 55 minutes to be able to share with you the heart of that material? And then how do I make it uh, something new for those who uh, have been exposed to this material for, uh, for years and, uh, and uh, make it meaningful for those who... I uh, have been are exposed to this uh, paradigm for the first time, uh, so I, um, I I gave it a try. I hope it works, uh, and I, I hope it works uh, in terms of of getting the big picture. Try to set the stage for the conference, the the big picture of why uh, this is so important today, uh, how uh, why it came uh, to that, and what the most important insights are that can guide us as we make the individual decisions uh, and the corporate decisions, as we make policies uh, in our country, and so on. Now, how many of you are here primarily as parents? Uh, as teachers or in the school system in one way or another? Good, a good, a good portion of you. Uh, helping professionals, working with families or children in one way or another? Good, another uh, a good group of you. Now, I, uh, I, I know we have uh, uh, some staffs of, of entire schools here, a music academy. Uh, we have various groups uh, coming from various areas. Welcome uh, to all of you. Uh, how, how, how many uh, do we have here that have infants in their care, either personally or as daycare providers and so on? Uh, toddlers? Preschoolers? <laughs> Not sure where it goes, the division <laughs> between those goes, you know. Uh, let's go uh, six, uh, six to 12 year olds. Ah, that's where you all are. Uh, uh, how many of you uh, uh, have or work with teenagers? Mm, good number of you. Uh, how many of you have adult children? Ah. Still giving him a chance here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and how many grandparents do we have? Good, good. A whole number of you. Well, I welcome all of you, whatever your role is. And some of you have multiple roles, of course. Uh, and uh, hope that this material on making sense of kids uh, also uh, makes sense of you. Now, when we were, uh, we were debating in terms of uh, what, is it, what is the theme going to be? Uh, it was, well, it's our 10th conference. Does that have meaning? Uh, well, it kind of has meaning. It's, uh, 10 is the, uh, is the base of our, our number system. And so it's going around for the second cycle, you might say. And so it's time to get to the base of what it's all about, uh, the root of all uh, what it's about. So, uh, so we decided, yes, we'll go back to our mission statement uh, what the Neufeld Institute was, was founded to do, uh, what its purpose is, making sense of kids. So that was the idea, to go back to the beginning, uh, to go back where we start, to take a fresh look at this. Uh, uh, um, 12 years hence, or 13 years hence, since the Neufeld Institute had its very beginning, uh, but the 10th uh, for the conference that we, uh, that we have. Uh, so I have spent some time in reflection, and as I mentioned, this, this, this how in the world uh, do I bring this uh, to reflecting on why we need to do this and, and, and what, what are the main insights? So uh, first of all, though, before we go there, uh, what do I mean by, uh, by making sense of kids? Uh, first of all, and very important is insight concerning the roots and meaning of a child's behavior. To be able to see beyond. Insight to see within the child. To make sense of a child from inside out. So important. 
to be able to read the anxious child as feeling unsafe. Uh, it, it, what to do will become much more obvious. When we read the aggressive child as frustrated and not yet had their tears about things they cannot change, we won't be tempted to increase the frustration in their life. Uh, when we read the oppositional child as feeling coerced, uh, we can find ways to resolve this problem. Uh, when we can read the impulsive child uh, as emotionally immature, we can take steps to compensate for this. Uh, when we read the bossy demanding child as in need of a strong, alpha caring uh, individual, we can get on with that challenge. And so this becomes very, very important in our day-to-day -day interaction that we can see beyond. But this is based on a deeper insight and to, to uh, uh, distill it to the essence, I would say that this insight has to do with what children truly need and how nature really works. That this is the insight that is absolutely required, is foundational to the first. Uh, it's the focus of my per, uh, presentation today, focus of most of my presentations. Uh, of course, the focus of uh, the theme of the book and so, and so on. Paradoxically, it seems to me uh, that the information explosion has, has actually not helped in this endeavor. The information explosion, with all the details, has somehow blinded us to the meanings. Uh, it's, it's a case of, of losing the forest for the trees, so to speak. There is so much, and there are so few, so much information, and so few to join the dots to put the pieces together. And so there's, a, there's uh, the enlightenment that we need seems to be eluding us, especially uh, when we look at nationally or internationally. Uh, a strange blindness seems to have descended uh, upon us. We certainly could not call this in terms of, with regards to children at least, an age of insight or wisdom. Uh, so what I want to share with you is, is what insights that I would consider most important that have been eclipsed in all the details. What are the insights that should govern our day-to-day -day decisions, our, again, our policies, our systems, and so on? Uh, but first, why? Why is insight so important? I can't remember my father saying, I just wish I could understand what makes you tick, Gordy. I, I, I don't recall him saying that. And I don't ever recall my grandfather yearning to make sense of, of, uh, of me or of children generally. Uh, so what has changed? What has changed? Uh, the parents of yesteryear uh, were not particularly preoccupied with making sense of kids. Uh, and and uh, they were not particularly asking questions of what to do. It didn't occur to them to do that. In fact, when parents ask questions of what to do, they would look at them askance somewhat, like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> well, uh, why is there a lack of confidence in terms of what we've been doing uh, for eons? What possibly could, you know, uh, could have happened here? So this is a new, this, this is a new, uh, a, a new problem. Well, basically... Why insight is so important as I see it today is because we have lost the traditional source of our cues for what to do and how to act as parents and teachers. And that source of cues basically was culture. Now when culture is intact, it provides us cues through rituals, rites, roles, as well as customs, conventions, social mores, the simple sit-down meal, for instance. The simple sit-down meal, which was part and parcel of every culture, every culture that is worth anything as far as I'm concerned, is, is, is you know, is, is around food. And, and being is around food. That's when you are together. When we were in Provence on sabbatical, three sit down meals a day. Now, how could that make a difference? How is that important? Well, that's where you connect. 
That's, that's where family gets connected. That's where all the important discussions are. That's when you're not trying to make something work. You're simply being together. Now new research comes in and says the single most important factor in the mental health of a child or even an adolescent is the number of sit-down meals correlated that they have had the previous weeks. It's come back to affirm that culture was right. But we didn't know the function it served. We didn't know the function it served. Now, it's obviously not sitting down and eating together as a family. That is, uh, that is it. It's something else. And what is that something else? Well, that culture was embedded in wisdom. The rights, all the roles. When you had a role, you knew what a father should do. You didn't have to ask, this is what fathers do. This is what big brothers do. Uh, this is what big sisters do. This was the role of a mother. There was no stronger role than the role of a mother. No stronger scripts than what to do. So the scripts were there. You played mother when you were a child. You played family. All of these kinds of things, the scripts were there. You didn't ask what to do. It, it was in your DNA. It was part of the culture that passed down. And that was the power of culture. In the age of materialism, the dollar has become more important. We've lost our culture. In melting pot countries such as ours, we lose our cultures and become, uh, become Canadian. And unfortunately, today, Canadian or American is often a person who has lost their culture of origin. This has created an incredible knowledge gap. Now, cultures aren't always good. Not good for children. Uh, they're not always good. This was for better or for worse. The issue is, is we didn't have to ask the questions. But it really depended upon whether the culture that was there had evolved in synchrony with what children need and how nature works. Cultures that were fairly heady, that came from the head, uh, did not serve these needs. Uh, cultures that were much more from the heart uh, in Europe, southern cultures in Europe, in, and, and rural cultures tended to carry the wisdom a whole lot better than urban cultures and cultures that came uh, from, uh, from the head. Uh, but the idea is if a culture had evolved in synchrony with what children truly need and how nature truly works, there was an embedded wisdom, an implicit wisdom uh, that gave rise or resonated with inner in, uh, natural intuition. Now, intuition means knowledge without words. Knowledge without words. So this knowledge was implicit. And what I'm going to suggest to you is that this loss of culture that we have experienced in the last two generations, that loss of culture has created an incredible knowledge vacuum. And that knowledge vacuum, the answers to that knowledge vacuum, is what makes sense of parenting and of teaching today. And so we are in reaction, basically, to that loss of culture. And that tells the story of where we are. And I'll just go over this. In the wake of that culture and the absence of insight. Now, insight is knowledge with words. Intuition is knowledge without words. Insight is explicit knowledge. Uh, of course, is, is that which it, uh, where there is consciousness, both individual and collective. Uh, there is no consciousness in Provence, in the, in the village in Roynia, where we lived on sabbatical, in Bali, where we had uh, a brief sabbatical. Uh, there was no knowledge in the parents of what to do. It was not, it was not explicit. It was implicit in their culture. These were in tax uh, culture. In, in Bali, 13 rites of passage, roles and rites uh, that governed every day and every role. And, and the, uh, uh, the culture was, was there. And according to one of, uh, of uh, Canada's leading anthropologists, uh, led to incredible, Margaret Mead, uh, led to an incredible uh, 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 openness and uh, and realization of potential among children. Uh, this was back in the 1940s. The problem is, is when we are stripped of our culture, we are laid bare to our own instincts, emotions, and needs. Culture protects us from it. 
Culture says, what do I do in this occasion? So I don't have to take the cues from inside of me. They're part of culture. They're implicit in this way. However, when we're stripped of culture, the voices inside of us become loud, our own emotions, uh, our own instincts, and so on. Now, instinct is not the same as intuition. Uh, Instinct is more an urge. Intuition is more a hunch. Intuition puts us in the driver's seat. It puts us back in control. Uh, An instinct drives us. Emotions drive us. They push us rather than draw us into. And so they're very, very different. And heaven help our children when we take our cues from our emotions, needs, and instincts. Uh, Parenting was not supposed to be about us. Uh, We're supposed to be there for them, them. Giving authority to what we feel like doing at the moment is the worst kind of tyranny and chaos in parenting. We find ourselves using the language, I need you to do, th- to do this. You're upsetting me. I need a break from you. Uh, you're making me angry. I don't feel like cooperating with you when you treat me like that. You're embarrassing me. All of these things are coming from us as if children were there for us rather than us are there for children. Our culture had protected us uh, from our own own emotions and instincts. When we lose our culture, we lose that protection. (laughs) So we have been stripped of thousands of years of cultural evolution. That's why I believe only insight can now save us from ourselves here, uh, from getting in the way of our parenting and teaching. Uh, Secondly, in this absence and power vacuum, or, or knowledge vacuum that we have, uh, uh, many of today's parents are reaching out to everyone everywhere. Parenting by Google has become a mainstay of today's parents. Parenting by blog has become a mainstay. There are many parents who read book after book after book. You can read my book, that's okay. You can read Deborah's <laughs> book, that's okay. But there are no end to the wannabe, wannabe gurus uh, that uh, have stepped up to get a piece of the action to fill this incredible knowledge vacuum. Uh, and, and so taking the cues from them, this is our incredible peer orientation as adults that has taken over. Uh, of course, this is not helping to insight. Uh, these, uh, they, they offer rare insight, only all kinds of instructions about what to do. The more likely we, uh, we are to become victims of the fundamental attribution error. What is that? Well, that's a very old principle in social psychology. When we studied perception, and there were the glory days when perception was studied in the 80s and 90s, and one of the first principles that came was this thing called fundamental attribution error. And what it means is, is basically when we don't make sense of someone, when we don't make sense, we are more likely to think that whatever they did was on purpose. And that has become epidemic in, in with regards to children. Now we ask them, why did you do this? Why did you, why did you hit your sister? Why did you lie? Why did you do this? Why did you do that? As if they were sitting down and thought about this and had a reason for this, you know, and, and as if they did this on purpose because they were charting to a certain, uh, you know, goal and so on. Oh my goodness, we don't even do this. Most of our behavior does not reflect our intentions. And often we don't have intentions when we behave. But I can assure you when it comes to problem behavior uh, that, uh, that well over 90, 95% of the problem behavior of children was never intended, was not on purpose. The problem when we think it's on purpose, the problem with the fundamental attribution error is we get on the wrong side. We start with an adversarial relationship with our child. We start with a confrontational. And the most important thing, if we want to really give children what they need, and we want to come and, and be in, in, uh, in sync with how nature works, is we need to come alongside our child. And we can't come alongside. We can't get to their side without making sense of them from inside out. So when we start with an adversary relationship, we get off on the wrong track. Fourthly, we're more likely to adopt strategies 
that are short-sighted and self-serving. When, when uh, we can't rely on a culture that has evolved for thousands upon thousands of years, when we can't uh, count on that wisdom, our strategies become very, very short-sighted. Our goals become short-sighted. We want the child to behave right now, not to be upset right now. Uh, we, uh, they become self-serving uh, in this. And, uh, and now, uh, now, partially to counteract the problem of number one, acting out of instincts and emotions, there is a new standard, a new standard for which we are to take the cues for what to do. And that standard, that standard has become, very simply, what works. What works. It is called evidence-based practice if you are in the helping professionals or in the teaching trade. What works. Now, that wouldn't be so bad if the graduate students, who are basically newbies at research and practicing their research skills, weren't taking into consideration what children need and how nature works. But that is rarely taken into consideration. So what works means what works for the parents. When you do sleep training, it isn't about the child. It's about what works for the parent. You know, when, when we uh, try to train our children to be nice at school and to act nice, this isn't in the best interest of the child. Oh my goodness, we make little hypocrites of them. This is for the teachers. And so, so much of this is all short-sighted and self the, the What works becomes the standard. Now, now, it does answer problem number one about being left bare to our instinct and our emotion and our needs. That is why time out were, were, uh, were prescribed by the Pediatric Association of the United States uh, 20 years ago now. Why? Because they were trying to stem what was happening is chill, uh, parents were beginning to hit their kids when frustrated, uh, strike out at their kids, and yell at their kids when frustrated. So it, a strategy of getting the kids out, out of, of the reach of parents was the way to bring this down. Now that has, that has evolved into all kinds of other justifications. But yes, it was meant to answer the reactiveness of parents. Uh, but what works um, has become a huge movement, uh, but it does not take into consideration that which children truly need. Uh, and so there is more, more of a problem. Lots of things work. Feigning separation works to get a child to come uh, to obey, but at what cost? To what, truly, truly, what children truly need? Or healthy development? Timeouts work. But at what cost to what children truly need and how nature works? Again, sleep training can work, but at what cost you get the drift? Pills work to manage behavior and to increase performance, but at what cost to what, truly, what children truly need and how nature works? And that is never the question that is asked. The use of consequences work, but again, you ask the question, well, what do children truly need, and how does nature work, and how does consequences fit into this? And I would suggest that decapitation works for a migraine headache. <laughs> but rumors have it that the cost may indeed be too much. At least we've got that one figured out. But the same principle would apply to all. What is a cost? And works for whom? And works how? And is that in synchrony with how nature works? Or does it compete? And is that what, what truly children need? And so that will be unfolded in the, in the uh, workshops that you will go to today. More likely to work uh, directly at desired behavior and outcomes. Uh, again, in the, in the knowledge vacuum, nature takes a long time to do its work. In the knowledge vacuum, we are tempted to take shortcuts. We are absolutely tempted. Can you imagine if we were ignorant about where our fruit, favorite fruit came from? The apples, uh, you know, the figs. If we were ignorant about this, 
And in our ignorance, we became so urban, we forgot our rural roots. And in our ignorance, we tried to make it directly. Well, how does it look? Well, we can get that shape. And we actually do this, of course, but we call it artificial fruit. We call it artificial fruit. And we well know that artificial fruit nurtures no one. It's not real. It doesn't sustain However, we don't seem to get this when it comes to children, the fruit of of natural development. We don't seem to get this. And so we push at learning directly. We push at at, at, at behavior directly. Uh, we, We try to get, we think that acting empathic is the same thing as being empathic. We think that acting obedient is the same thing as a child desiring to be good. It is not. It is not. In pushing at learning, we have in school sabotaged, destroyed the curiosity that is meant to motivate learning. Do you know that there are more children curious in kindergarten than there are in grade 12? Do you know by the time children are in grade eight and nine, they are not going to school to learn. They're going to school to be there with their their friends. We We destroy, in the process of pushing learning, we destroy the spirit, the movement to learning. And the same thing goes on. We keep on doing this over and over again. Nowadays, the big thing is about shaping caring. And then when you have caring behavior, kind behavior, empathic behavior, Uh, We give approval for this. We give a green sticker for this. We do something like this. Now, when a child acts caring to be able to get the teacher's approval, is that caring now? No, we call it narcissism. We call it selfishness. We call it hypocrisy. You see, there are certain things we mustn't do. There are certain things we cannot do. In trying to get somebody to act caring, we destroy the essence of how nature is meant to take it there. And I could go on and on and on. Teaching responsibility, we destroy a a sense of agency. Uh, Any time we put the emphasis on form, right form, good form, social, you know, the, the social behavior, we are endangering the very spirit that would give birth to that thing. Nature requires time. It requires raw material. In our hurry, we are taking shortcuts. Acting more caring or more mature or more empathic will certainly not make it real. And so getting ahead of nature has always been the gravest developmental sin. It sabotages the ability of nature to do its work. If a child is stuck, then getting them unstuck should be our goal, not trying to get the child to act more mature than they are. And finally, more likely to teach life as if it were a skill. When we forget about the magic of life, when we forget that we cannot and have never, ever been able to create life, when we realize we cannot command growth by deciding that we're going to be more grown up, uh, it, it, no, it doesn't result by telling our partner to grow up. Uh, that doesn't work. Uh, when we realize that this is nature's business, we realize our Im- uh, limitations. Uh, now, schools are particularly prone to this, uh, but too many parents are buying into this, is that uh, life uh, can be taught as a skill. We cannot teach self-control. This is the fruit of emotional maturation. We cannot teach resilience or adaptation. Uh, This is the work of, of, of emotion. And we certainly cannot teach emotion. We cannot teach a child to be moved to care. We can teach them how to care, but not to care. We cannot teach a child to be moved to be good. We can teach a child how to be good but not to be good. Uh, The problem, of course, with school, basically, is that uh, a school is there while nature does its work. Those of you that have heard me uh, present on this uh, topic before, 
I, uh, I, I talk about a certain book that became a bestseller on New York for weeks and weeks and weeks. All I ever needed to know I learned in kindergarten. Now, the ages between five and seven are the most uh, uh, active developmentally of all. If the conditions are conducive, nature goes to work in a major way. And the seven-year-old is completely different than the five-year-old. But the kindergarten teacher sits there watching just as this happens and then takes credit for all of it. And so the idea is, is that school is where children grow up, mature. Why? Because they are at school where this is happening. We take school out of the okay equation, but keep what children need. Keep what children need, and we find that children actually do better. So it's nature that is credited to the work. Not school, but you can see the problem. It reminds me of a certain cartoon. I hope you can see this. <laughs> this is a newly graduated Harvard graduate psychologist <laughs> with the latest techniques. Now, the cartoon is not mine, but the captions are mine. New evidence-based practice. <laughs> And you can't argue with this research. The evidence is in, right? New research demonstrates that the longer the picture is held, the more likely a change will occur. So governments and school systems impressed by this new information have mandated uh, that uh, and pass legislation that all caterpillars must now go to butterfly school <laughs> to develop their butterfly skills. Well, I overstate it, but you get the idea. So, to review, why is insight the answer? Let me review. It is the safest way to compensate for the loss of culture. It answers the problem of emotion and instinct uh, and it keeps us doing the things that our children need. It is the only way back to our natural intuition. And oh my goodness, we need our intuition back. We need to find it again. This is a place where we find our sense of agency, our, our confidence. Uh, there is a tremendous crisis of confidence in today's parents and teachers. And that confidence is because they're not going from the place that, that of, of that place of natural intuition. It is the only way to restore inner confidence. The problem is that as soon as we start letting experts tell us what to do, as soon as we start parenting by Google, as soon as we start parenting by book, it dumbs us down. Why? Because we're not thinking from the place. It's just like somebody was telling you to put the dishes away. Remember when you were a kid and, and you know, your parents were telling you, do this, do that, do that, and you don't get it from the inside. Why? Because you've got to be in the driver's seat. And so it dumbs you down when we take direction. It dumbs us down, whereas insight smartens us up. It increases our confidence. It is necessary to counteract the prevailing tendency to use adults as a reference point for dealing with children. We thought Piaget changed all of this, one of the great developmentalists, when he said fundamentally, children are not adults. And yet today, after all of these years of trying to make sense of adults, we assume that children are, are the same dynamics. And then we take the hand-me-down things like pills that we use for adults and give them to children. Uh, we think that we've got to make them conscious of things. We've got to teach them about things, like teach them about food. When we found out, oh my goodness, when we teach elementary school children about food, they get anxious and alarmed by it, and it creates more, more, uh, 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 more eating disorders. We're going around the, the, uh, the wrong way about this. We shouldn't be teaching about children. That is adult responsibility. And we shouldn't be thinking that children are simply miniature adults. It is the only way to restore a sense of agency to get us back into the driver's seat uh, where parents and teachers should be uh, the sense of inner confidence of being the answer their children need. And it tends to bring out the best in us. When we can make a sense of children from inside out, when we have a sense of them, 
uh, it reigns in our own reactiveness. And so there are many reasons that 13 years ago when I was thinking, well, I, I had my arm twisted about starting this thing called, what is called now the Neufeld Institute, and uh, I, I, I'm allergic to responsibility, so that was not my idea <laughs> of, of running an international organization. Uh, but when it came to, well, what should our model be? What should our mission be? And uh, at, at that time, I said, it, it can't be anything other than making sense of kids. It is our mission. It's what we must do. It's what we uh, uh, must devote to do. And so this is, this, is, uh, uh, this is part of our mission statement. This is part of what we do, part of every course, part of the prefects of many of our courses. Uh, instead of what, you may say? Well, instead of ranting, like I'm doing right now, Instead of ranting because it doesn't get on with the job, and I promise I'll get on with the job quickly because my time is running out. Uh, and so uh, it's uh, uh, in, instead of attacking other approaches, which I do occasionally, but I try to keep it down uh, to a minimum. Uh, instead of warning against parenting practices that are not in the best child's best interest, because again, this, is, this doesn't say the way through. Uh, in, instead of advocacy work, uh, telling parents and teachers what to do instead of informing policy. I backed off from all of those things. Not that they aren't really important, they are. Those things are important of implementation and policy making. But if we try, I can remember this, this in, in, incredible uh, time in BC here in the 1990s when we decided to reform our educational system. And so uh, in the idealism of that day, they decided to go with a developmental approach. Uh, if those gray-haired teachers will remember the blue books, the blue binders. And this was there. And then it came about, well, uh, it, it, it was an idealistic form of developmental, uh, a developmental approach. It was based on an age and stage theory, which by already had by then been debunked. And so it, the children don't automatically uh, grow up, they need conditions that are conducive. So it was based on an age and stage theory. And it came, it, 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 uh, BC ran into trouble right away. It never did get implemented. Uh, but Portland found out about it and asked the BC government, please tell us why it is and the philosophy this is based on. They didn't know. These were all strategies. So I got a phone call saying, Dr. Neufeld, will you go down uh, to Portland and explain to the Oregon educational systems why developmental you know, approach is a good thing? And I thought, oh my goodness, this is a bad omen. It will never work. We'll ne it will never go off the ground, even though it was flawed. But the point is, is all the advocacy work in the world would only work till the next election. It would only work to there. If there's not insight, and so I am absolutely convinced that the answer is an insight of every parent and teacher, and as this insight spreads, there will be pressure on policy. There will be pressure on systems. There will be pressure to do this, but it will come from a place that will stay instead of doing advocacy work. So again, it's the chosen route here. Now I'll go to the most important though, but what insights? are the most important in today's world. What are the insights? Uh, after uh, uh, 13 years from when I decided this was a mission statement, uh, over 45 years from when I started uh, consulting with parents and teachers and trying to put the pieces together uh, from this, I, uh, there are three of these that are absolutely key three insights that are more important than anything else and are probably more eclipsed than anything else in today's world. And the insights are basically relationship is a context for raising children. The attachment of a child to the teacher is a single most important factor in the, in the learning equation and the behavior equation in school, bar none. There's no controversy about this. There's blindness. The research is all out there. The most significant part in therapy is a client's relationship to the therapist. There's no controversy about this, only blindness. We have known this already. The most significant factor in raising children for them or for the parent is the child's attachment to the adults involved. And that is the topic of my book and the topic of most of my presentation. Secondly, emotion. Emotion is nature's answer, not the problem. Now, emotion has been eclipsed ever since, uh, ever, ever since 
Uh, John Locke announced that the problem with women and children are they're too emotional. And considered in, this was the 16th century, is that, that we are rational. That is, men are rational, not women and children. Men are rational. This was superior evolution. And we should all go into our heads and have reasons for what we do. Well, it turns out that he was absolutely wrong, but this somehow hasn't got through to us. And what is right about women and children is that they are more emotional. Not what is wrong, and that emotion is the answer. It was nature's answer. It is the first motivational system about how to move us. When we feel our alarmed, we're moved to caution. When, when, when uh, somebody is telling us what to do and our attachment agent, uh, uh, instincts are not engaged, uh, we are resistant, we oppose, because we must be influenced by anybody that is not in our village. And, and, and all of these things, when, uh, when something doesn't work, we get frustrated and we try to change things uh, and so on. And all of these have reasons. Every single emotion has its reason. It may be irrational, but the brain has its reasons. Now, this has only got halfway into our consciousness now. Emotion has come back as a darling subject of neuroscience. Emotion has now entered into our schools, but still that emotion is a problem. Not the answer. We're not starting off and saying, oh my goodness, honey, I can see you're frustrated. Uh, that frustration needs to come out. Here, let me help you find a way. Uh-uh, that's not what we're saying. We're saying, get a hold of yourself. Calm down. Don't be so stir uh, stirred up. Uh, calmness and equanimity are the, are the attributes you must get. Self-control is more important. We're not listening to our feelings, and we're not teaching children to. We're getting off on the wrong track. No, there's not something wrong with emotion. This was nature's answer, and we've got to start at the beginning. And that is still a best-kept secret, that emotion is nature's answer. Thirdly, play is essential for a healthy development and emotional well-being. This is the newest thing. This has only come about in the last six to eight years. Uh, there is... Uh, uh, two huge movements, uh, one that is North American-based and one that is British-based, uh, uh, multidisciplinary, discovering that what was right underneath our noses, what we thought was frivolous, what we thought did not count, is the single most important factor in child development, even in emotional health and well-being and in mental illness. In fact, playfulness has now become the key indicator of emotional health and well-being. When we lose our playfulness, we're in trouble. And playfulness is exactly the opposite of depression in terms of the brain. And all of these things are there. Children need to play. Adults need to play. And we have become a work-oriented society, an outcome-based society. Now, what kind of play is necessary? Well, play basically with these kinds of properties. Uh, there's all kinds of play, but true play is always engaging. Always, not always fun, but always engaging. And it's not outcome-based. Many people ask, does video games play? Mainly not, because video games is outcome-based. You know, when a child plays a game, uh, let's say a board game, and he'll only play if he wins, or plays, uh, plays a softball only to win and not, doesn't enjoy the activity, that no longer is play. It's work. It's work. And so you can play piano, it can be play, or it can be work. You can, uh, many activities can be one or the other. But the difference is, is it's not outcome-based. It's not for real. You can be sisters for real as kids, but when you play being sisters, whatever you say and interact doesn't count. <laughs> you know, your parents may, may uh, confront you, don't yell, don't scream. Don't worry, mommy, we're only playing. playing. That's the beauty of playing. It is a parenthesis. It is a break from reality. It has a beginning and an end. It must have a beginning and end. And all mammals have play signals. And we found out that these play signals are important. But culture keeps these play signals, so we start losing them. But children need to play. Uh, play serves both attachment, relationships, and play serves emotion. So the third insight is necessary to make good of the first two. Because they, they, and so we are always free to play, and so we're free not to play. And therefore, it protects our will. 
There's no true counter will in play. It's always safe. doesn't mean physically safe, but it means emotionally safe. As soon as your feelings get hurt, it's not true play anymore. It's expressive. It's not entertainment. It's not stimulating. It's something from inside needs to come out. And these are the seven properties of play. Incredible, beautiful. Unfortunately, it's an endangered activity. It's being replaced by instruction. It's being placed by screens, replaced by screens, by false play. This is, this is the incredible, urgent cry of many of us gray hairs that from various professions, anthropology, evolutionary biology, uh, many professions are saying, oh my goodness, that which our children need. You see, play is nature's workshop. Play is nature incognito. Working invisibly, we lose our play, we lose the opportunity for nature to do its work. I'm going to just turn the question a little bit here, just in the few moments we take back to answer just a little bit different. How does nature, uh, so the same question, what are the most important insights? We could turn it around to say, how does nature take care of our children? How does it? take care of our children. And again, obviously, uh, you already know the answers because I gave it, but it's the question that's different. Through relationship with the adults responsible for them, via emotions that are meant to serve them, and through play where it can do its best work. Now, what about relationship? Well, the interesting thing is, is that as humans, we don't really have survival instincts as most of us think about them. That is, if the earthquake happened, if there is stress, if there is any kind of thing that stresses a child out or an adult out, the first thing that comes to the child is not to run to safety, but to run to mom and dad. Where's mom? Where's dad? Where's my children? As, and this is true for all mammals. When there's any stress, it automatically evokes our instincts for togetherness. Why? Because... Because uh, proximity to those that we're attached to increases our probability of being taken care of. And that's what survival is about. It's about being taken care of. You see, so nature for mammals said, okay, we're doing away with attachment instincts as we've known them for the other creatures. And we're replacing it with togetherness as the answer. Because in togetherness, in relationship, is where we feel cared for and where we take care of. And so all, the, all of it has to do with relationship. That's why relationship is the preeminent need. That's relationship is even more important than food. And that's why Harlow's monkeys, that experiment with Harlow's monkeys, when he put his little monkeys under stress, instead of going for food, they went for contact. And he demonstrated to Freud, who he was arguing with, uh, Freud said, food creates relationship. And Harlow said, "Uh uh-uh, relationship is the bottom line. There isn't more important than that. Uh, They will go through through danger to get to, to relationship. Relationship is how nature takes care of us all the way all the way, creates the external womb, that womb that then replaces the, the internal womb uh, cre- uh, out of a relationship in which nature continues its job of growing our children up. By emotions that are meant to serve them, again, every single emotion, alarm, frustration, these are not mistakes. These are on purpose. We have to, in a contrived society, Uh, We have lost this. uh, Shyness is not social anxiety. Children are moved to to shy away from contact and closeness with those that they're not attached to. Why? Because they weren't meant to be in that context. There is nothing wrong with shyness. In our original languages, in English, in Hebrew, in our original languages, in Spanish, and so on, the truth was there. It was simply called reserved. And what was it reserved for? Our people. Why? Because it goes back to relationship as a context in which children are meant to be raised. And so emotions are how this works. And then play is where, again, nature does its work. And play is how nature takes care of a a relationship and emotions. We play our children into attachment. When we lose 
the, the play together, the singing together. When we use the times of play together as a, fa a family, uh, they're no longer uh, attracted to, uh, uh, to attachment with us. In fact, the research says that we actually are more attracted uh, we, we are attracted to playfulness in each other. And if we look back to our first meetings, what attracted us to our spouse, playfulness would have been a large part of that, uh, of, of that answer. Playfulness is, is incredible in this. Now, um, so what matters most in raising children? Turn the question around just a little bit more. What matters most in raising children? Again, again. You know the answers. Relationship matters. Emotion matters. Play matters. Emo relationship matters most. There couldn't be anything more important to this. Now, many of you are local here, and, and uh, probably uh, uh, many of you will have watched uh, the last game of the, of the, uh, of the uh, Canucks, and uh, they're weren't any tears in the stadium. I mean, there weren't any dry eyes in the stadium, and there certainly weren't any dry eyes in our house. And uh, it, was, uh, uh, it was a story, supposedly, about Daniel and Henrik Sedin, uh, our beloved uh, Swedish twins of, of, uh, of, of the Canucks. And uh, pardon me, those from Australia here and those from other places for an in-house story. Uh, but uh, uh, the journalists are trying to make sense of this. This outpouring of affection, outpouring of devotion, outpouring of emotion. And uh, it's time for Ian McIntyre, one of our local uh, sports journalists, to come up. And he starts off uh, kind of hesitantly, and he says, this is not a story about, uh, about Henrik and Daniel Sedin. And the uh, others look a little bit, uh, uh, you know, what do you mean? The whole thing is about Daniel and Henrik Sedin. says, no, it's not a story about Daniel and Henrik Sedin. This is a story of relationship. The relationship between them, the relationship uh, with their fans, the relationship of the fans to them, the relationship with Vancouver, the relationship with the sport of hockey. And then you could see that he wasn't getting any understanding and he left that theme. I've elaborated a little bit. He left that theme. And I wondered how many get this, you see, because relationship is not something we see. What we see is what we think it's about. What we see is what we think it's about. It's not about that. It's about the relationship with. That's what it's about, but that's invisible to us. That's why this insight is so important. I don't know why Ian McIntyre uh, figured out what he was looking for, but you have to look for it to see it. And if you look for it, you'll see it, but you've got to have that insight before you see it. And when you have that insight, it becomes self-evident to you. You see it all over the place. You can't not see it, but it doesn't mean anybody else does because it's the invisible truth. It's the thing that was always there. It's what culture took care of. If culture is about anything, it's about creating the relationships that are required. If the Ten Commandments are about anything, those instructions about how, how to build and preserve a theocracy, if you look at them, seven out of ten of the commandments are simply about preserving the attachments that are required. If you look really closely, I mean, there's even a couple of, of, of commandments about not messing with your neighbor's attachments. Uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's all about attachment. Emotion matters. Emotion matters. To safeguard children's feelings, to know when they go missing, to come alongside children, to help them express and play matters. Now, I'm going to move on. I, I, actually, uh, I actually thought I would get through this uh, much quicker than I did, so I'm going to go to the ending slides because I know that's where we are, right? Mom says yes. There are two questions that would transform our parenting, caregiving, and teaching. Two questions that would change our decisions, that would inform our decisions. Two questions that would inform what has happened, uh, etc. And these two questions are, what do I see instead of what should I do? Now, they may set you on the path towards trying to see. But what they do is they ask and beg for insight. 
And I assume that's why most of you have come today. What do I see? And refrain from reactions until I can make sense of the child from inside out. This should bring me alongside the child. And this is what I suggest you ask in going into your sessions today. What do I see of, you know, think of a child, a student, as someone in your care. What do I see instead of what should I do? And secondly, what does this child need from me to enable nature to do its good work? What does this child need from me to enable nature to do its good work? These are not urgent questions, but there couldn't be any questions that are more important. And if culture did anything, it protected the urgent from getting in the way of the important. And if insight can do anything, it can do the same. And so, uh, so our hope is that in making sense of kids, we can actually get through this knowledge vacuum, uh, come out the other side where consciousness becomes the answer to culture. We can't reverse it. We can't go back to reinvent culture. Uh, materialism uh, has taken care of that. We can go forward. And I invite you today to go forward with us uh, to making sense of kids. Thank you very much.